the stuff I'm going to be talking about, rather than, you know, I had considered, should I just go through some of the highlights from the book? And I thought probably what would be most useful to you folks is it'll be sort of a um, current events through the lens of the book. So things that, you know, you would know more about current events on these issues if you read the book, right? So that's what I'll try to do. And so my dad is, is here. My mom and dad are here with me. And my dad always told me if you're giving a talk, first tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then told them what you told them. Now, time is short, so I think I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'll tell you, and then that's it. That's all you get, all right? If you donate to the Mises Institute, then I'll remind you what I said. Okay, so what we're doing, uh, we're going to first talk about inflation, of course, and then I'm going to talk about, you know, is a recession coming and some of the, the conventional indicators and so, you know, in terms of the timing. And uh, this thing called the yield curve inversion, that's going to be the, the more technical one because we, we, it's, it's tricky for us to give talks to groups like this because some people – you know, have, have been immersed in the Austrian literature, and they come to this, and, you know, they don't want to just hear something they, that they knew about 10 years ago, but then we know there are, are newcomers here, too, and we don't want you to feel overwhelmed. So if you feel a little bit intimidated in this part of the talk, don't, don't worry that, you know, the, the next one is more fun. We talk about Putin, okay? So everyone can, can identify with that one. Okay, so in terms of consumer price inflation, what this is showing, it's going, this is 1950 all the way up to the present, so this is just showing a graph of the 12-month percentage increase in the consumer price index. So when the government comes out and says, oh, inflation over the last 12 months was such and such, this is the number they're talking about. And so you can see here that this really is, you know, a, a very high level going back a good 40-plus years. The early, you know, it, it had peaked in the early, late 70s, early 80s, and then came down. And so you have to go all the way back to, as it was falling from that you know, historic high to, to see inflation that's been at this level. And as some of the speakers have alluded to, that number is definitely understated. All right? So if you're curious, it, it's interesting. So in economics, as in some other fields, you can mislead people and you're not technically lying. Right? And so here, the, the sort of tricks they do, and in and of themselves, it's, it's not that any one of these things is, is crazy, any of like these, these moves they make statistically to make the reported inflation number it, for the interest of brevity, I'm, I'm going to keep saying inflation, but what we mean in the Austrian community is price inflation, right? Because there's a distinction they make between monetary inflation and price inflation. So for those who don't know, this might be interesting to you, that way back originally, the word just inflation, if people talked about inflation, they meant that the money and credit supply was expanding. And then over time in the 20th century, the, the meaning of that term morphed to mean, oh, prices are getting higher. Right, and so now when someone talks about, oh, inflation's pretty bad, you think, yeah, stuff's getting more expensive. You don't automatically think, oh, you mean that you know the amount of dollar number of dollars is expanding, and that that change happened over time. And a lot of Austrians are cynical and they think that's, you know, that was some sort of deliberate shift because that it's harder to blame the culprit, right? If if you're just if it's the symptom rather than the cause. And so we'll see in a minute in this talk that you know it, it, that connection is still there. That that it's the the money supply increasing. That's what's what's driving this. But just to finish that original train of thought, so you can see um, the year-over-year -year change is, is up at about 8.5%. Th those were the numbers before the, the recent one came out, it was about 8.3%. And so, so again, some of the tricks they use, in case you're curious, um, it, 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 the point I'm making here is that it's actually misleading to say, oh, this number is bad, but it was worse here. Because the way they calculated this number the, the techniques they used was different from how they're calculating this number. And if they use the same techniques, this number would be, you know, bigger than it is now. So people argue about whether it would be as high as it was back then. But still, it, they're, it's closer to, you know, the late 70s, early 80s now than the numbers would suggest. And so, again, some of the techniques, things like they, they make what's called a quality adjustment or the, your, the term they use is hedonic um, and the idea is, okay, yeah, you can say, oh, how much is a, is a new car year after year? And that number gets higher over time, right? The amount you would spend on a new car now is a lot bigger in terms of number of dollars than in 1950. But if you said, is a new car now the same thing as a new car was in 1950? Obviously, no, the new car now, like the tires go a lot more before blowing out, stuff, air conditioning, power windows, power steering, right? So it's, it's a much better thing now than it was in 1950. And so arguably it would be overstating price inflation to just look at how many more dollars you spend now to so make a quality adjustment. So that's one technique that they use to keep this number lower than it otherwise would be. All right? But again, you can kind of 
you know, it's, it's not an objective fact of the world to say how much better is a computer now than it was five years ago. Okay, so what I'm going into now is to show you, the people up here on the panel and Jeff, you know, we had been alluding to the Federal Reserve's actions and how that's driving, that's why stuff's more expensive, right? That, yes, corporations are greedy, but they were also greedy in 2012. So why is it that all of a sudden prices surge so much? It's not merely corporate greed because that explanation has been true. It's like if there's a plane crash and they send in the inspectors and they come back and they're waiting at the news media and you know, the, the grieving families. And what, what caused it? What caused it? You look at the black box and they say, it was gravity, right? <laughs> that yes, that was involved, but it, the question is how come gravity caused that plane to crash on this flight, but it doesn't happen typically. So again, corporate greed's always there, but the issue is why is it that the companies were able to get away with raising prices so much over the last two years compared to you know, previous times. So one thing to look at is uh, how much the Federal Reserve has, has, the assets they've bought and put on their balance sheet. So this is 2004, this is the present, and this is total assets on the Fed's balance sheet. So you can see typically, you know, up in the early 2000s, it was, it was, it was increasing, but relatively small. And then that was QE1, this right here. Now, because we had to be able to fit the whole graph in, that doesn't look like it's that big. But at the time, right, when, when if I had done this chart, like as of this year point, this would be a shocking, unprecedented jump. For those of you who are familiar with Glenn Beck, at this point, he was on his TV show. Uh, he had that chart on the back wall, and he was in a forklift. And so he would drive along the timeline, and then the forklift would have to lift him up to show that he was lighter back then, so it was easier. Um, so it was, and, and, and you know, he was freaking out. Look, are you kidding me? Look at what the, and now you see that's, that's child's play, right? That, that's so-called QE2, this little thing there. And then they said, well, that didn't work, so what are we gonna, let's do it again. Let's do QE3, and this time we mean it. And so this was the third round of so-called quantitative easing, and then they, they actually did, uh, under Janet, uh, it started right at the tail end of Bernanke's tenure, and then Janet Yellen presided over, it was flat, and then it started coming down, and then Powell came in, and they really did actually, uh, when Powell first came in, the Fed was not only refraining from buying more assets, but they were actually letting, you know, as existing assets matured, they were rolling it over somewhat, but not as much, like, so they were shrinking their balance sheet. And then, of course, you see what happened during COVID, where it just shot up tremendously. And then also, too, it's been continuing to do that. So it's a little bit truncated on this chart, unfortunately. Um, so you can't see it. It's getting a little cut. But this just keeps going straight. Okay, so despite, and I'll reinforce this in a few minutes, but my point is that with all the talk right now of the Fed tightening and how they're doing it, and the markets are, are coming down hard because of all oh, the Fed's tightening, finally they're turning off the monetary spigots, all they've really done, if you want to use a car metaphor, is they've taken their foot off the gas. They haven't even tapped the brakes, really. And, and you might say, well, didn't they raise interest rates? And I'll, and I'll show you in a minute that even that is um, perhaps not as, as, as tight as you think it is. Okay, but in terms of just the, the overall size and some of these numbers, so going into the fall of 2008, right before, you know, the crisis really hit in September there, the Fed's balance sheet, it was about like $850 billion, something like that, assets that the Fed held, and they were mostly treasuries, right? That's what the central banks of the world did is they bought and sold government debt, and partly they did that for reasons... I mean, you could be cynical and say, yeah, that was the whole point is the, the, the central banks were given their privileges to fund the government's deficits, and that's true. But on the flip side, they typically were either not allowed or it was just customary. They wouldn't be buying and selling more mainstream private sector assets because of the temptation for corruption, that you wouldn't want central bankers having the ability to buy specific asset classes. That all went out the window with uh, the financial crisis, in particular, the Fed just started loading up on mortgage-backed securities, okay? And I, I explain it more in the book, but that was not only, I would say, bad policy in terms of economics, like, you know, bailing out the, the people that made bad decisions and how can a profit and loss system function if 
if you make an investment in housing, let's say, and things go well, you get to keep your profits. But if it blows up in your face, the Fed comes in and bails you out because you're too big to fail. That's not a that's not a good system. It's not, it's not merely that it's unfair to regular people, but it encourages these institutions to make riskier bets if they know we keep the upside and on the downside, you know, the Fed bails us out. But beyond that, it was arguably illegal what they did. And I, I get the, into this in the book, but the, the Fed was is allowed to lend freely. But in terms of the assets it could buy, there was a lot of restrictions. And so what they did is they created these maiden lane LLCs. And technically, uh, what was happening is the Fed would lend money to the LLCs who would then go out and buy mortgage-backed securities. And so the Fed could say, we're not, we're not buying mortgage-backed securities. That'd be illegal. We're just lending money to this firm. I mean, they happen to be buying a bunch, but that's not our business. Right? So that's what was going on there. But you can see, so that went up to above $2 trillion, and that was, again, why people like Glenn Beck were freaking out, because the Fed more than doubled its assets. So acute, what, you know, what does that mean? One way of putting it is, in the few months after the financial crisis, the Fed created more high-powered dollars than it had up to that point in, you know, since its founding in 1913. Right? That's what it means to double something, is to say you did more in that short period than you did earlier. QE2, QE3, and then you see, though, with COVID, it just dwarfed what they did back then. So at this point, again, right before the financial crisis, the Fed had about $850 billion in assets, and now it's sitting on over $9 trillion. Okay, so the question, though, is, okay, you Austrian types, you're blaming the, the you know, oh, now prices are rising, the public is upset, and you're telling him, oh, it's not corporate greed, it's not Donald Trump. It's not even Joe Biden, really. It's the Federal Reserve. That's who you should be mad at and take your pitch, pitchforks and go that way. And so a, a cynic could understandably say, well, wait a minute. You just got through showing us that the Fed was pumping in money, buying assets after uh, the financial crisis. And yet, we, you know, we didn't have six dollar gallon gasoline in 2010. So what's what's going on? Surely there's more to the story. And there is. And what I will say is that if, if you look at the, the money supply in, in the hands of the public, then the story really does fit. And it's, it's not that there's some weird thing that, oh, yeah, we're not really sure why there wasn't big price increases in 2010, 2011, but now there is. But it, 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 we, do, we do know, right? So that M2 is it's a monetary aggregate. That's why they use the, the letter M. And loosely speaking, you could say it's money in the hands of the public. Okay, so the earlier chart I showed you, that was sort of like what the Fed does at a high level, but that's not directly going into people's checking account balances, right? So M2 is a broader measure that includes things like not just physical currency, like Benjamin Franklin's in your wallet, but also your checking account balance, retail money market funds, things like that. And so what this chart shows is the year-over-year -year increase in M2, which is, again, a particular measure of the money supply in the hands of the public. This right there, make sure I'm not lying to you. Yeah, that's 2020. And so that's, you know, that's when the pandemic hit. And so you can see that M2 growth, you know, bounces around. This is 1985. So, yeah, right after the financial crisis, which is right here, this was the so-called Great Recession, this gray bar, you can see, oh, yeah, M2 growth was kind of high in there, and then it dropped, and then it jumped up again. But it wasn't like it was historically high, right? That M2 growth right after the financial crisis, right when the Fed was doing those rounds of QE, was no higher than it had been in the early 2000s or even in the mid-1980s, okay? And so in retrospect, even though the Fed was pumping in a bunch of money, it wasn't actually spilling out into the broader measures of the, of the money supply. And in the book, I give some reasons, well, why might that have been? But I'm, I'm just showing you now that is the case. So the story that we tell that, oh, yeah, if you want to understand how come prices are going through the roof, yep, corporate, corporations are greedy, things like that, Wall Street shenanigans, but ultimately it's because there's more dollars floating around that the public's able to spend. That story does still hold up. So you can see that it, this, that figure of M2 growth really shot up way above the historical norms um, going into the pandemic. And so that it's not surprising now that prices are rising so much. And also, even though it has come down, notice it's still pretty high. Okay, so again, when we say, is the Fed slamming on the brakes? No, all it's really doing is not pumping in as much as it was before. But in terms of growth in money supply in the hands of the public, 
that's still up at historically, you know, the highest, you know, tied for highest levels it's been over the last several decades, though it's not as high as it was six months ago. Let me do a real quick technical point for the purists in the crowd. I actually was hesitant to say this, what I just told you, because M1, which is a more narrow measure, did shoot way up after the financial crisis. And so I was open to the idea that maybe there, you know, there is more nuance here and we shouldn't just say, oh, money supply explains everything. But what happened is that I, in preparation for this talk, when I saw the M2 figure, is people were panicked after the financial crisis of 2008, so they changed the way they were holding you know, their cash. And they moved it out of money market funds into like literal checking account balances. And if you remember, FDIC bumped up I think it went from 100,000 to 250,000 was the insured amount for your checking account balances. And so, so you know it's safe, right? Um, and so people were panicked because I mean, of the carnage in 2008, if you remember that. And, um, and so that's, that's partly what people did. And so because M2 includes both checking account balances and money market funds, it largely offsets. So that's why M2 isn't doing anything too special right there, whereas M1 did shoot up. Okay, so again, that's just kind of a technical point. So looking at M1, you would have thought, how come there's not severe price inflation in 2010? But it's because, oh, that's really just getting moved away from money market funds. Whereas since the pandemic, it's like by any measure, all of them put together, they're not just moving money around. There's a lot more money that's in everybody's possession. Okay, so let me just talk a little bit. So now I'm, I'm transitioning to, okay, we were talking about inflation. Let's talk about recession. Is there going to be recession risk? That's something I talk about in the book. And you say, well, you know, the book's supposed to be about money. Well, in the Austrian school, this guy Ludwig von Mises, he looks like a fun guy, doesn't he? Um, he's a snappy dresser. There, the, apparently, there was a story where uh, you know, Mises led this private seminar, and Richard Ebling told me this story that you know, he was always dressed like this, and it was really hot. This was before they had air conditioning. I think they had electricity, but they didn't have air conditioning. And the students showed up, and they were all expected to dress like this. And they, and they said, Professor Mises, it was a really hot day. And they said, Professor Mises, can we at least take our jackets off for your seminar? And he said, no. He, he did not allow them to do that. And he continued with the lecture. Um, so in his theory of what causes the business cycle, right? So a lot of even main, uh, mainstream free market economists like Milton Friedman, others of that uh, sort, they will sometimes say things like, hey, if you don't want to have a business cycle, go live in the Soviet Union, right? Meaning that a business cycle is sort of the, and I'll, I'll get more specific about Friedman's particular views, but in general, it's sort of like, yeah, I mean, freedom is, is messy, but it, you know, the benefits are, are outweigh the costs that if you, you know, if you want to have all entrepreneurial innovation, Schumpeter's view of creative destruction, and you got to, you know, fact is, if you open up a new store, if it were guaranteed to succeed, that would mean, you know, people don't have the freedom to not shop there, right? So with freedom comes the possibility of failure. And that sometimes leads people to think that, oh, yeah, the business cycle is a normal feature of the market economy. But according to Mises, it's not. It's government intervention in money, in particular, how money gets into the markets through the banking system. That's what causes the regular ups and downs of the business cycle. So yes, in general, under capitalism, somebody opens up a pizza shop, it could fail that the people might have misgaged customer preferences. Maybe they just, they're not good at negotiating prices with the wholesalers. Who knows what? You could fail. But why is it under capitalism, it seems like there's periods of general prosperity where every business almost is doing well, unemployment drops to real levels, and then there's a crash, and everybody says, oh, we, we were too optimistic. Like, why do these waves happen? And so Mises had a particular theory of that. Let me just summarize that for you, and then I'll apply it to what's going on right now. So first, what happens is that the banking system, especially if there's a central bank which sort of coordinates this process and exacerbates it, floods the market with unbacked credit. So because the central bank can effectively create money out of thin air, and notice, and this is what's critical for the Austrian theory of the business cycle, it's not that the central bank just gives the money to people. And it's not even that it goes and directly, at least you know, in modern times, it's not that it goes and directly buys fighter jets or you know, hands out uh, food stamps that with newly created money. All that new money, it goes through the credit markets. 
And so the, the prices that get distorted the, the most and initially before the rest of the system responds are interest rates. And so they get, they get pushed down to artificially low levels. And then it's, it's those, you know, those, the combination of those two things with this new money coming in through the credit markets, pushing interest rates to artificially low levels, that creates this feeling of prosperity, the, the boom, the upswing, but it's built on an illusion. Okay? And so in the Austrian view, prices serve a function. They, it means something. Right? People need to know what's the price of a barrel of oil. And the government wouldn't be doing anybody any favors if the price of oil is supposed to be $100 a barrel and the government comes in and somehow makes it that it's only $30 a barrel, but they haven't increased the amount of crude production, that doesn't mean there's more gasoline for your car, right? It just means they changed the, the, the price on it, and so it's not getting more gasoline into the vehicles. And so whatever information that that $100 price was conveying to the system that people were responding to, if you keep it artificially at 30, that causes problems, right? And so... Uh, some of the panelists were talking about, I think, I think Patrick in particular, was talking about the price controls in the 70s. That's a perfect example of what happened. That it's, it's not that all of a sudden there was more gasoline to go around. It just meant by keeping the price artificially low, instead of the high price being the, the lever or the signal that made people say, you know what, I don't need to go to the gas station today. I'm, you know, I still have a f some left in my tank. I'll, I'll wait until Tuesday. Or when you get to the pump to say, you know what, I don't need to fill it up. I really just need five gallons because look how expensive it is. By keeping the price artificially low, when everyone's trying to get there to the pump and do that, it would run out, the first few cars that were there. And so that's why they had to have that rationing scheme in place. That's why they would limit how much each car could buy or, you know, depending on where you were, there could be rules like your license plate has to start with an odd number or an even number if it's this day of the week because they weren't letting prices serve that function. Okay, so back to Mises, interest rates serve a function in a market economy, and it helps coordinate things over time, right? People save. What does it mean when you save? It means you could buy stuff now, but you're deferring it to the future, right? And so entrepreneurs need to know that because there's different things you could make. We could, the way we could use resources right now, we could build more factories which doesn't help us right now. We don't have more TVs right now if we use our resources to build a new factory, but down the road we're more productive because now workers can go to that factory that didn't exist before. And so there's like intertemporal trade-offs that can be made. We can produce more now for the immediate present or we can make things now that make us more productive down the road. So in a sense it's like transferring production from today to the future and that interplay between producers knowing what to do and consumers saying this is how we'd like you to you know, direct resources, interest rates help coordinate that in a market economy. And so Mises' point was, if the interest rate is pushed artificially low, you're not doing anybody any favors. It's not that there's more machinery to go around. There's not more minerals that have been discovered. There's not more farmland. We're not actually richer. It's just that signal is not doing its job anymore. And it's just like if the government comes in and gas is supposed to be $6 a gallon, but they just say it's illegal to charge more than three, that might seem like it's a good idea, but it's actually not doing anybody any favors. It's just going to cause shortages in lines. So with this, a low interest rate, if it doesn't actually reflect how much the public is saving, doesn't really make us wealthier. It screws things up. And the particular way it gets screwed up is it causes this boom where entrepreneurs start longer projects than they have the resources to complete. So it lasts for a couple of years, but then when, for various reasons, the central bank gets skittish, the banks get worried because of you know, the loan quality, and they tighten, now all of a sudden there's this wave of failures where a bunch of businesses say, wow, we were too optimistic, we shouldn't have hired so many people. And they start laying people off and closing down you know, operation. And that's what we think of as the crash. Okay, so if that's the background of the theory, let me just apply that quickly to... Uh, the Austrians versus the Chicago School in the Great Depression. So Murray Rothbard is a representative of the Austrian School. The, his quick explanation of what happened in the Great Depression was in the 1920s, the Federal Reserve was too liberal. It allowed for an expansion of the money supply. That's why you know, there was the, the boom in the stock market that I'm sure you all learned about in the late 1920s. Again, in school you probably learned 
oh, it's because we didn't have the SEC. We didn't have – people could just borrow money and put it in the stock market. It was crazy back then. It was wildcat, but it, it was like that in the 1910s also. How come what we think of as the boom in the stock market and the 29 crash that led to the Great Depression, why didn't that happen earlier in U.S. history? Things were even more liberal and unregulated back then, right? So that's the issue. And Rothbard says it's because the Fed was formed in – 1913, after the war, they tightened, and then the 20s, they allowed for this huge boom that eventually led to a crash. And so it was the boom of the 20s that made the crash in the 30s necessary. And then, in case you've never heard it, Herbert Hoover actually was not a free market guy. He actually had a New Deal light, and then FDR had the real New Deal. And so that's why what should have been a bad crash in the early 30s lasted for the Great Depression. In contrast, Milton Friedman said, oh, it's because the Fed... Uh, foolishly tightened in the, in the 19, late 1920s when they didn't need to. Okay, so even among free market schools of thought, Chicago and Austrian, there are important differences when it comes to money and banking. Okay, so again, loosely speaking, the Austrians would say it's the boom that causes the bust, whereas even the Chicago school type will often say as long as the Fed doesn't tighten too much, we don't need a recession. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is even relevant today with certain economists like Steve Hankey, for example, and others that, you know, real good guys, solid on a lot of issues. But Hankey was giving remarks saying, oh, yeah, the, the Fed still could get a soft landing. They just have to keep money supply within a certain band. Whereas in the Austrian school, at this point, a recession is inevitable. There have been years of artificial monetary expansion, artificially low interest rates. Mail investments have been made, right? So people have invested in the wrong things. That's already done. You can't just flip a switch and turn that off. So, yeah, the, if, if the Fed and the government did better policies going forward, it would not be as bad. But the point is you can't avoid a recession at this point. And so I would agree with some of Powell's critics who are saying he's, he's just, you know, tr trying to ease the public into this. He's being unrealistic. Okay, so just to summarize what I've said to you, Think of the, the carnage that we've seen in the stock market recently, and that's when the Fed hasn't even started selling off assets, and M2 growth is still pretty high. And so then you might say, though, you, you might say, but what about the yield curve? Didn't that recently invert? And isn't the Fed tightening by raising interest rates? Okay, so like I said, this next part, it'll be just a few minutes. It's, it's the most technical of what I'm going to say today, so hang in there, folks. And I think, I don't know if they bring a dessert yet, but maybe you need it right about now. Um, Okay, but but this is you know this is important stuff if you want to know about a recession. So that's why I decided this was worth getting into. So you may have heard it. So this is not an Austrian talking point. This is standard stuff that's, that the financial sector knows about. Some guy uh, Harvey Campbell did his dissertation in the 1980s on this that a so-called inverted yield curve has correctly predicted eight out of the eight of the last recessions, going back to right after World War II, and it has never given a false positive, okay? So I won't get into the nuances here in the, in the book I do, if you're, if you're curious. You gotta correctly define, like, what do you mean by an inverted yield curve, and how long does that signal have to be enforced before you say, yep, that's a go, it's a signal. But th this is a way I can intuitively show you what I'm talking about. So what this chart is showing, it's the yield, on the 10-year treasury minus the yield on the three-month treasury. So normally, the yield curve is upward sloping, right? So if, if the y-axis is the interest rate on government debt and the x-axis is showing the maturity, so like three months, six months, one year, and so forth, up to 30 years, normally the yield curve is like this, meaning if you're going to lend your money to the government for a long time, they have to give you a higher interest rate measured like per annum, right? It's not just that you get a higher interest rate total. It's that even per year, it's implicitly they're giving you more. But when the yield curve inverts, it flips, meaning the interest rate yield on short-term treasuries is higher than on long-term. So no, that's unusual, at least since World War II. But as this chart shows, so on this chart, that would mean it's below this black line because this is the zero point, right? So if the 10-year minus the three-month is negative, that means the three month is bigger than the 10, right? And so you can see, and these gray bars are recessions. So this is 1985. This pattern, like I said, goes back to World War II, but this chart I could grab pretty easily from the Federal Reserve's website just to show you the pattern. So you can see 
every time that difference goes below zero, meaning the yield curve inverted, soon after there's a recession, right? It happened for the other ones here. And also notice it doesn't go below and then there isn't a recession, right? So there's no false positives or false negatives if you calibrate it right. And so with that then, if the question is, okay, if we're going to, and by the way, in the book I explain how that lines up with Mises' theory, okay? With the time we have here, I can't get into it, but it's not merely that this happens to have predictive success and so, hey, we don't know why it works, but it looks like it does, so let's run with it. It actually lines up with the, the theory I just told you a minute ago. Like in other words, if you believe that Misesian theory of what causes this is the business cycle, this pattern actually isn't surprising. Okay, so it, that's partly why I, I like this, is it makes sense to me that why this would be the case besides the track record. So if that's your framework and then you wonder, is a recession imminent? Interestingly, so it, it might be, right? None of this stuff, people c tomorrow could just stop going to work. Well, they probably will because it's Sunday. People on Monday could just not go to work and then measure GDP would collapse and you might call that a recession or not. But, you know, so people have free will. They can do whatever they want. It's not that these lines control human behavior. But I'm just saying, if you're asking, is this pattern in the cards right now? It actually isn't. It's going the wrong way, right? In other words, so, so this, this one here, that already happened. That was the, the yield curve inversion before the 2020 recession, right? That happened in 2019, this, this one. So if we thought there was going to be a recession in the next 18 months, the yield curve here should have already gone below this black line again. And yet you see, not only didn't it go down, it's going the wrong way. It's going up. And so what's happening there, why is that going up? It means that the yield on 10-year Treasury debt is rising more than the yield on three-month Treasury debt. So the Fed has more control over short-term rates than long rates. And so what that means, I would say, my interpretation of that fact, is that as inflation expectations are affecting investors and they're realizing the Fed doesn't have this under control, I think you know, high inflation is here for a while, they're insisting on higher rates for like 10-year loans to the government because they're building in the fact that uh, uh if prices are rising at 8% a year, even if it gets down to 6 or 5% in a few years, I need a higher yield if I'm going to lend you my money for 10 years. So that increase is more of a jump than what the Fed is doing by raising short rates right now. So I would say, in a sense, the fact that the yield is going like that means the Fed is behind the curve, that the Fed actually, so yeah, it's raising rates, and so that's tighter than if they didn't raise rates, but if you ask, are they even just keeping pace with the public's moving expectations of just price rises? No, they're not. Just like in, to give you an example of what I mean, in interwar Germany, right, you might have famous things about wheelbarrows of cash and everything, interest rates skyrocketed, but they didn't keep up pace with the fact that prices were rising so much. And so there was a sense in which real interest rates were very loose and low during that period, even though on paper it looked like, wow, the central bank in Germany was, is really jacking up rates, but they weren't anywhere close to keeping pace with their inflation. So I would say you got something like that on a smaller scale happening now. So again, my point being, the Fed really isn't tightening, it's just they're not as loose as they were, if you will. But it's not like they've switched to a hard, tight posture by any stretch. Okay, I just got a couple more minutes here. So, some of the issues, and I know Peter alluded to this, uh, it's, it's been hot recently. So it, where this all comes from, I think most of you probably know this, but because of, you know, when Russia, and we say when Russia invaded, as good Austrian economists, we know it's Russia doesn't do anything. It's individual soldiers obeyed orders from a person, and then they did such and such, right? Countries don't do anything. Um, so when we say, uh, so the, the U.S. and its allies, you know, punished Russia by shutting down bank payments and things like that and targeting those oligarchs. And um, so one of the things that the Russian government did is well, two things. One is they linked the, the ruble to gold ostensibly, and then they also insisted on oil and gas payments be made in rubles, or at least gas. So just real quickly, let my comments on these. So the first thing, actually what they did, and, and, and Peter knows that, and he, he sort of said it, they didn't really link to it officially the way it was in the classical gold standard. All the Russian government or bank did is it announced we will buy gold at a fixed rate of 5,000 rubles per gram. Okay, they were not saying if you turn in rubles, we will give you gold. 
and that's really the critical thing to link your currency to gold is to say we have stockpiles of gold. If you hand in our currency, we'll give you the gold. That's what gives the, the currency strength. So what they did was like the one half of it, but that really, if anything, was, would put a floor under the gold price. It wouldn't put a floor under the ruble price, right? If the world price of gold and measured in rubles had jumped to 8,000, the Russian bank saying, we're prepared to give 5,000 rubles if you sell us your gold, the people owning gold would say, well, no thanks, because we can get more in the market, right? So, so that was a, t a tepid step that didn't actually, you know, formally do things the way they were in the classical gold standard. And then they even abandoned that pretty soon after, where, after they announced it. They went, they went to a variable payment system. And then this thing about uh, gas payments in rubles, traditionally, uh, purchasers of Russian exports would use either dollars or euros, and so then uh, Russia was insisting that you got to pay us in rubles, and by itself, like, I don't think that's that big of a deal, because originally, all it's really doing is just changing the sequence. So originally, someone, if they have euros and they buy, you give it to Gazprom, Gazprom can take the euros, go to the foreign exchange market, and buy rubles with it. If instead you're saying to the foreign, you know, the German importer, no, we need rubles, okay, they would take their euros, go to the foreign exchange market, trade the euros for rubles, and then buy the gas that way. So it's just changing the sequence of the transactions. But ultimately, I think if anything, all it means is Russian companies that used to have stockpiles of euros or dollars now have rubles. So if anything, I think this really is just... Um, affecting R Russian firms, not so much affecting what the rest of the world has to do. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll turn it back over to Jeff.